Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today we have Dr. Eric Rauschway, a professor at the University of California, Davis. Professor Rauschway has expertise on U.S. policy, social and economic history from Civil War through the Second World War. He has consulted for government and private agencies, including the U.S. Department of Justice and a major Hollywood studio. In addition to his books, he had written about history for a variety of publications, including the Time Literary Supplement and the New York Times. Dr. Rauschway's recent research focuses on New Deal and the Second World War. He has written several books on how federal policy affects the U.S. economy and how the economy, international and domestic, influences U.S. policy. His research has been featured in the New York Times and on National Public Radio. He's just finished a book on the conflict between Republicans and Democrats over how to compact the Depression at its worst in 1932 to 33. So after all that, and first things first, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Thank you very much. I generally like to begin um, by asking our guests, what got them interested in history? Well, I was certainly given lots and lots of children's and young adults versions of history when I was a youth, and I read that along with every other thing that I was given to read, including the backs of cereal boxes. So I was a fairly omnivorous devourer of anything in print, um, and history was part of that. I, I ended up mm-hmm. having a very good teacher for both 8th and 11th grade versions of U.S. history, and I think that was the thing that really inspired me, his sense of history as a sort of tragic comedy, I think, is the thing that, that really got to me. The idea <laughs> that uh, there were just awful, awful things in history, but unless we brought ourselves occasionally to laugh about things, we were never going to be able to reckon with it, that we required a certain sensibility to deal with it, and and detachment was part of that. So I ended up being a history major in college, and then uh, during the recession of 91, when I graduated, people seemed to think that there was no point in trying to get a job of any kind, and so I went to graduate school right around the time Uh, Everyone was being promised that there would be jobs aplenty uh, in five or six years. It didn't turn out. (laughs) Uh, As I'm sure your response indicates, you know, that it didn't turn out that way. But, um, (laughs) you know, I I managed eventually to land on my feet. So here I am. My laughter probably indicates, but I was on the other side of that five or ten years. And they're still telling us it might be another five years, but we'll get there. It's always five years away. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That big bull market in in tenure track jobs is always just around the corner. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we can keep on dreaming. So. Um, it's funny that you say that because I actually ended up going to grad school. I finished my undergrad in just a, the second. Of, when you said the Great Recession, I was thinking 2008. And I was like, wait a second. Nope. There's the, there's the second one. So that's, that's when I decided to go to grad school. Yeah, I mean, I realized from the detached point of, a, of, a, of, a, of an economic historian, the 2008 one was far worse and turns out to have been far more consequential. But uh, at the time, the 1991 was pretty miserable, too. I mean, in an ideal world, we would have neither. But I guess as an economic historian, you'd be able to tell us that we're going to continue it's, to have them, right? So far, the utopia eludes us, yes. Well, we'll, we'll have to check back in with Adam Smith <laughs> if we can. Uh, Your research and books, they focused a lot on federal policy and economy and politics. And I would say, just based on what I've read of them, the type of policy you do is kind of political and economic history, which is a lot of ways different from the sort of military and diplomatic history. Can you tell us about um, why you got to economic history and what what interests you about it? It's something that I got into, I think, when I had my first job which was first proper or my first tenure track job or equivalent thereof, which was at Oxford University in England. And there was a tremendous emphasis in Oxford on politics and economics for undergraduates. I don't know if you know this, but many of the leading figures uh, in British politics hold something called a PPE degree, which is philosophy, politics, and economics, which only Oxford University offers. Now, you can see from British politics today how wonderfully well that education is serving the British elite. But uh, at the time, <laughs> at the time, it, it was certainly a, an area of some interest to me because it was a major part of the education that was being offered at Oxford in the social sciences. So I sort of gravitated naturally to studying in the field that I was being asked to teach. 
And but you continue to return there, I assume, because something about economics is interesting. I, I, I'm coming at this from a sure. culture historian. Let's start looking at numbers. I start well, looking well, at what. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, as as you observed already. These uh, these big economic uh, downturns seem to be of immense importance to us, and I decided there was really uh, no point in sort of letting it go uh, and leaving it in the hands of the economists so that, that historians needed to offer our own perspective. And I was going to be happy to do that. In other words, it struck me, I guess, as con of contemporary mm -hmm. relevance. So I thought I would stick with it. <laughs> I guess you can always make an argument that it remains rele relevant no matter whether what. Whether we like it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, whether we like it or not. Um, and the other thing I've noticed just reading, um, your book is that you don't focus as much on, I guess the great man theory, you, and you focus much more on how policies and how um, I said I said party po po policies and parties um, kind of move bring about change. Um, maybe including those great men, but like much more broader base. Can you talk a little bit about why we shouldn't take that angle? Well, you know, I started out um, with an education uh, primarily in social history, and as I moved into being more interested in political and economic history. I never wanted to get away from the people who are on the kind of the sharp end of these uh, policies and these big business decisions. So, for example, in murdering McKinley, you know, I tried to move back and forth between McKinley's operations and the Ways and Means Committee and then the um, effect those policies had on somebody like Leon Cholgos, who, of course, ended up being McKinley's assassin. And I thought that if you could sort of look back and forth between these two things, you could both show the potential scope of social history and also, though, its, it's ultimate frustration, which is although you can say a lot about what it meant to be somebody like Leon Cholgos, you couldn't actually then blame any of those trends for his decision to shoot the president. So it was, a, it was an exercise in sort of what you could and couldn't explain with that kind of history. And that's that's kind of the approach that I've continued to take. I do think that, uh, of course, one must be a social scientist uh, as a historian to some, in some respects, but no matter how much attention one gives to those broader trends, ultimately, uh, there's an awful lot of contingency and personality involved, especially at critical moments. I would agree. And I think um, your McKinley work especially does a really great job of um, kind of providing that back and forth, um, that, that divide, I thought was really um, both very convincing, just, just the way you, you went back and forth with it, but I thought it illustrated a lot more than you might get from just focusing on the McKinley alone. Let's be honest, a book about McKinley alone is not going to be very interesting, <laughs> <laughs> even, if he, even if he is getting shot at it. Sorry. Well, I mean, you could have focused just on his assassin <laughs> alone, true. too, right? That's true. But I mean, you know, I think that uh, there's a certain reverse sensationalism in that kind of thinking, because, you know, it, it, we have to show how consequential these things are. As, as we teach our graduate students, we have to be able to say, so what, you know, about uh, uh, our focus? What, why does our research matter? What are, what, are the, what are the consequences of these things that we're looking at? Absolutely. Um, I, I think so. I think that's kind of one of the things that's continued to drive me when, when asking and researching, I'm, I'm working on a PhD okay. proposal right now, but when I'm, as I'm writing it, I'm like, so what, 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 does it, what does it matter? And that, that doing that has led to a lot more, forced me to illustrate my idea. Yeah, well, more. I mean, a lot of us get into it because we like the stuff. We like the sources. You know, we just really have some kind of visceral connection to those things. But when you're forced to explain to, you know, the, the uh, kind of mythical person in an elevator why you want to do this and do it in, you know, between floors, you know, you really have to be able to say this really matters because... Um, so I guess to turn a little bit towards the main focus of today's interview is um, that strange interwar period. Um, I think most of our listeners are familiar with World War One and World War Two, of course, but a lot of people get a little bit vague, kind of about that in-between area. Um, I think there was a lot of partying. There's something about the Gatsby's. Is that That's right? right yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sure. I think that, uh, you know, for for many historians of this era, we really want to say, look, this is um, 
all part of one big set of events from 1914 really to 1945. And you can't understand anything that mm-hmm. goes on, whether it's during the actual wars or the period between, without reference to that larger chunk, right? You know, Winston Churchill called this the modern 30 years war, and he's sort of not far off in that assessment. So when you talk about the Jazz Age, I mean, the Jazz Age is only really enabled by the fact that the the rest of the industrialized world has blown itself up in the Great War. And so uh, the only sort of economy left standing, as it were, at the end is the United States. And, um, you know, therefore, there's a much larger market for and interest in American cultural products during that Period. And and as I think you also know that there's a kind of standard story here that uh, to borrow from E. H. Carr, the United States was offered world leadership in 1919 and notably refused, right? So that the um, mm. administrations of the 1920s turned towards nationalism, uh, using a slogan that we will today find familiar: "America First, which the Harding campaign used, as well as. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s to signify a return towards nationalism and a moving away from the rest of the world. It's a period of peak immigration restriction. It's a period of the last big hurrah for high tariffs and a general sort of uh, Mm -hmm. rejection of involvement with uh, the globe and its various affairs. And that um, sort of rigidification of the economy, especially with respect to international influences, is a significant factor in leading to the Great Depression, which of course is a global and not merely a a United States event. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the the driving move behind that that term of nationalism? Because as far as I I, I was told when I was learning about World War I, this was the very first time the United States really got itself really involved in the rest of the world's politics. Yeah, this... um, World War I kind of seems to many Americans in 1914 to happen to them. You know, it, its causes largely come from outside the United States and don't have a whole lot to do with American history as it has been going on up to that point. It's sort of here European affairs intrude. It seems that way to a lot of people. And then, of course, American involvement in the war is not very long. You know, America, the United States declares war in April of 1917, but it doesn't really field troops until any significant numbers anyway, until the following year. It's only involved in the last phases of fighting in the war, but it's it's short, but very intense. And you have these large numbers of not very well-trained American soldiers getting killed in much uh, in disproportionate numbers, precisely because they're being put into this long established slaughter machine without any sort of idea of what uh, what they should do to defend themselves so this as i say this this seems like an intrusion from outside mm-hmm. and then it's quite disastrous and then it's um you know it's its outcome seems to be quite terrible so uh, a lot of americans were sensible of the republican party's uh, expressed desire to put all that behind them mm-hmm. i think that takes us right to that to the parties, what what were these parties like at the time? Very different from today. Right? Well, no, there. It's certainly after World War One that they begin really to become like the parties we know today. I mean, you, you're right in many respects; they're different. But it, but it, there's the things that we would now recognize are sort of visible in terms of setting the parties apart from each other. Maybe more so with the Republican Party than with the Democratic Party. You know, the Republican Party had been home to many progressives, uh, as they called themselves. In in the 19 teens, these were people who thought of themselves as allied to Theodore Roosevelt, the Republican who uh, had the uh, ill fated uh, but quite influential uh, <laughs> third party bid in 1912. Um, but after mm-hmm. that, a lot of state parties, and I should say this research uh, showing this was done by a doctoral student who worked with me named Casey Sullivan, and it's really quite outstanding, it shows that a lot of the state parties sought to drum the progressives out of their ranks and to turn the party mm-hmm. in a more, uh, what we would today recognize as a conservative direction. And this was largely successful by the time of the 1920 election. So you have a party, a Republican party in the 1920, that looks very much like the one we know today, that's very leery of attempts to uh, regulate the economy, uh, specifically leery of any attempts to limit the actions that can be taken by the managers of business and the owners of capital, not very friendly to labor unions, 
And, uh, you know, generally, especially like the Republican Party today, uh, leery of too much involvement with uh, international affairs. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, you know, had its fling with progressivism in the era of Woodrow Wilson, but it was and remained for a long time compromised by its dependence on its southern wing, which, of course, was its white supremacist southern wing, uh, which was in favor of Jim Crow. And so the Democratic Party was split uh, in that way, and, and in many ways fatally split, you know, notoriously in the 1924 convention at New York City, the Democratic Party went back and forth for weeks over who to nominate for the president, whether it would be the Irish Catholic Al Smith of New York or the Klan endorsed William McAdoo, sometimes of <laughs> Virginia, other times of California, and eventually had to settle on a compromise candidate. So it was, um, it really, you know, had a self-inflicted wound that festered for a long time over that issue. Mm-hmm. And then we have uh, two Republican presidents. We have um, Coolidge and then Hoover, right? How, how do they kind of respond to this interwar period and set up, I guess, Roosevelt with the shadow right. hanging over all of it? Well, Coolidge and uh, Hoover both descend from Harding and they stick with more or less that same kind of nationalist idea. Hoover may be a little less than Coolidge, but they... Uh, preside in a period where immigration restriction is tremendously popular. This is the period when the United States passes the National Origins Act, which is the 1924 law that bars all immigration from Asia and then sets strict quotas on immigration from Europe, quotas that are based not on the 1920 or 1910 or 1900 census, but on the 1890 census which predates much of the immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. And so it's intended to bias immigration towards Northwestern Europe. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a strong uh, anti-immigrant streak in that Republican party. There's also a strong protectionist streak where there are increasingly protective tariffs passed through the decade. And then there's retaliatory tariffs passed by other countries. So there, again, there's a sort of a nationalist economic and cultural policy of this Republican Party, which is also the party of prohibition, which is itself mm. a uh, thinly disguised bit of anti-immigrant legislation in many respects. You know, unlike 19th century temperance, which is about how I might drink too much, prohibition is about how those people over there definitely drink too much. And usually they're, you know, the Irish or the, or the Italians or the Germans or, or, who, or what have you. Interesting. I actually didn't know that. So that's um, that's that's sort of that Republican party, I think, uh, in a nutshell. Um, and then, of course, Hoover, as you mentioned, is overtaken almost immediately in office by the fact of the Great Depression. And, mm -hmm. and he didn't. How, how did he first try to respond well, to it? Or I guess I guess we should probably ask what causes the Great Depression if I have an economic <laughs> story, right? right? Uh, <laughs> yes, well, I could give you my standard lecture on what causes the Great Depression. It usually <laughs> takes about 50 minutes to get through. The, um, I suppose the short answer, there are an awful lot of international debts left over from World War I. You know, World War I is a sort of cataclysmic event, not only militarily, but economically for the world. And one of the things it achieves is that the United States goes from being the world's great debtor to the world's great creditor. Uh, and whereas the United States had borrowed an awful lot of money prior to World War I, you know, for the purposes of developing the West, which is to say, you know, building railroads and fencing in lands and otherwise exploiting resources. Obviously, some of those ventures failed, but broadly speaking, that's a sort of productive form of investment. You know, when the, when the, when the balance shifts and all that money gets borrowed back by uh, Europe, they plow it into literally destructive investments, you know, shot and shell and ammunition and poison gas and all kinds of things that not only don't yield any return, but in fact destroy a lot of, so they're in tremendous debt after the war, and they also have killed off a lot of their better uh, laboring members of their population. So everybody owes everybody mm -hmm. money and everybody owes it to the United States, which puts the world in a very precarious position uh, after the First World War. There, which is, can only really be sustained as long as the U.S. continues to lend money 
to the recovering countries. Well, the U.S. kind of stops doing that in 1928 because the Federal Reserve Board is trying to curb borrowing for speculation in the stock market, and that leads to a bunch of uh, countries sliding into recession, including Germany, um, which in turn has a kind of cascading effect on everyone they owe money to, ultimately American banks. You begin to have a wobbly credit structure in the United States. Since a lot of the buying of the jazz age is credit-fueled buying, people stop buying stuff. That means that people are out of work. And then you have a sort of vicious cycle where you know banks can't really lend money or sometimes they're imperiled in their very uh, continued standing. People mm -hmm. go out of work, people don't buy stuff, et cetera. Things just get worse and worse and worse. That's, so that's, that's in a nutshell why it's international and also how it affects the United States. That's a much better job of explaining it, I think, than the, I think I, my high school teacher ever did, which was like, well, they weren't drinking, so they were just doing it all on the stock market. <laughs> well, there's, there's, I'm sure there's that dimension to it as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's the, what I've just given you is the extremely cartoony version, but it will do you in a pinch, I think. Right, of course. And then um, that gives us, of course, to Hoover. Right. right? So, yeah, the, the crash really occurs in the fall of 1929. Hoover at that point has only been president since March. So it's most of his presidency is occupied with almost the entirety of presidency is occupied with the Great Depression. And, you know, Hoover's response is to lean on his past as an organizer of cooperative enterprises. You know, I mean, he started out as a businessman. Of course, he was... Um, well, he started out actually being very poor. He came from a, a, a one-room uh, house in a very small town in Iowa and kind of you mm -hmm. know, made something of himself, as they said in those days. He uh, became a mining engineer and then became a very, 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 very rich man in the gold mining business uh, through dint of success and managerial success in particular in that business. You know, he retired relatively young went ultimately into public service and philanthropy first privately and then in government service when Wilson uh, asked mm -hmm. him to head the food rationing effort for the United States during the war. So he had a long track record of being a great manager. And in 1927, when uh, Coolidge was president and Hoover was secretary of commerce, there was a massive flood on the Mississippi River affecting multiple states and many, 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 many thousands of people. Hoover was asked to head the flood relief effort and again to kind of organize the Red Cross and other relatively, you know, cooperative or volunteer organizations. And he proved to be successful at that as well. So he ran for office as that, you know, the sort of the master of emergencies, the great engineer, the great organizer. And when the Depression came, yeah. he tried to meet it more or less by the same means, which is, you know, getting people together and urging them to. Uh, do their uh, civic duty and to act in the sort of the common interest. Only it it it, it just it just didn't work. You know? I mean, he had the, <laughs> the 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 scope of the crisis being a global economic crisis was far too great for that. You know, the structural weakness, particularly of the American banking system, was far too great for that. But even even on the sort of smaller level, where Hoover tried to address these problems by you know getting the nation's principal business leaders together and extracting from them a promise not to lower wages. You know, that's, that's, that's great. It's just that an awful lot of people were employed by other smaller scale business leaders. And of course, a pledge not to lower wages is not a pledge to lay people off, not to play lay people off. So, you know, that kind of thing is, may have looked good, but it was ultimately ineffective. And so all the voluntary and state and local agencies that mm -hmm. you know existed of course to provide aid to the unemployed ultimately were tapped out and there was no place to turn but hoover was adamant that the federal government would not get into the business of aid to the unemployed because he was just profoundly ideologically opposed to that idea which he viewed as socialist mm -hmm. was uh hoover's would you kind of from what i'm saying it sounds like hoover was Ultimately, he failed to have a big enough vision of both the crisis and what the government could do, I guess, to respond to it. I think that's true. And I think that, um, you know, in, in part, it's hard to think that anyone would have responded right away with a more capacious vision. I mean, even now, even with the 2008 Great Recession or whatever we're calling it in our rearview mirror, 
Um, you know, it still mm-hmm. wasn't a catastrophe of the scope of the Great Depression, thanks be, right? Uh, partly because, yeah. you know, as soon as that crisis began to hit in 2007 and 2008, an awful lot of people of uh, various political stripes said, if we don't respond rapidly in some way, this may turn out to be as big as... Well, in 1929, nobody oh, had yeah. any su- such thing to compare it to, Right. Uh, you know, thank thank goodness. And, you know, we have a basically an N of one here, as the social scientists would say. So, uh, you know, to be absolutely scrupulously fair to Herbert Hoover and everybody else in 1929, I don't think people knew how bad things could get. Uh, Of course, you know, that's in 1929. Maybe a year later, two years later, you might begin to have a different (laughs) view of things. And then that's where I think Hoover is more blameworthy, is, you know, by the end of his presidency, by, you know, the into 1931-32, he's undermining his own subordinates who are telling him to take more aggressive action. You know, he establishes a president's commission on unemployment. You know, the head of it, who is uh, the head of a major business enterprise, I'm forgetting, I think it was AT&T, although I might not be right about that, tells him informally, we're going to have to have federal aid to the unemployed. And Hoover says, you know, I'm going to have to sack that guy because he's a weak sister. That's a quotation. You know, he um, is, as I say, he, even when his subordinates tell him he has to take more aggressive action, he refuses. You know, and most that's most notable in the case of the last big banking panic during his presidency when the Federal Reserve appointee, Eugene Meyer, who he put in office, uh, you know, is telling him he needs to take aggressive action to shut down the banks and to prevent this panic from reaching catastrophic proportions. is Hoover just adamantly refuses to do it. So as I say, some point in there, he becomes blameworthy. It's hard to pick the day, but some point <laughs> between 1929 and 1932, 33, you can say that Hoover can be held to, 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 uh, to held responsible for what's going on. <laughs> not to account no. well you know it's a big account so yeah. <laughs> i got a lot to spread around yeah. i guess um so that's that I, and then we have a president who doesn't have a failure of vision yeah. i guess would you would you say Roosevelt? yeah so um i mean this is what now we're getting into what my new book is about this is i have a book out now called winter war which is about the period between the 32 election and roosevelt's inauguration in march of 1933 and i think yeah. Well, so good. Kind of you. Um, you know, this is the last time a president had to wait till March to be inaugurated. They change that after that period. Um, but it's still weird, you know, that we make chief executives wait so long before they take office after being elected. And it's a period in which, you know, the government and the society more broadly is really vulnerable to having an outgoing chief executive who may be inert or worse. Uh, you know, during that remaining mm. time in office. It's also just an incredibly eventful period, and consequentially so. And Roosevelt, uh, on the one hand, is busy sort of organizing the Democratic Party so that when he does become president, he can immediately take action on a number of fronts, you know, farm relief, uh, relief for the manufacturing sector, and banking and monetary relief all are on the table during those months. And he's busy sort of whipping up support without trying to tip his hand as to what he's going to do. Um, at the same time, affairs are just catching up with him. It's not till uh, January, but then all of a sudden, Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany, fulfilling a lot of people's worst fears or even beyond, you know, bringing about something that everyone said, oh, that will never happen. And uh, that really Mm -hmm. alarms Roosevelt right away and reorients a lot of what he's thinking of doing in terms of how can the United States become a counterweight to Nazism in the world. It's also the period during which Japan is booted out of the League of Nations for uh, its invasion of Manchuria. So we can see, you know, the seeds of the Second World War already in these months. And we can see how Roosevelt's policy is reoriented towards not just getting the United States out of the Depression, but getting the United States out of the Depression so that its economy will be strong enough to prove the durability of liberal democracy. So, as I say, it's a very important. And uh, not, not only that, uh, of course, also in those months, uh, somebody tries to kill Roosevelt and almost succeeds. So, it, it, again, it brings to light the importance of contingency in history. You know, it really sort of sharpens that question, what if, you know, that, yeah. that had gone differently. 
to to turn to what he does actually do as far as um, organizing the party. Um, you, you mentioned that he he's focusing on really developing the under, I guess the foundation for the New Deal in this point. Um, where, where does he get his inspiration and his ideas from? Well, there are multiple sources for what becomes the New Deal, um, partly because the New Deal becomes so many things. But one of the major strains is progressive republicanism. In his first cabinet, Roosevelt has Henry Wallace as his Secretary of Agriculture, former Republican, Harold Ickes, Mm -hmm. Uh, Secretary of the Interior, former Republican, Frances Perkins, first woman Mm. to serve uh, in in a cabinet, and also a former Republican, William Wooden, less well-known, but as a Secretary of Treasury, another liberal Republican. Um, And Ickes and Wallace, particularly, and Perkins too, will not only be, you know, liberal Republicans, but among the more liberal New Dealers, ultimately, in his administration. And Ickes in particular, uh, in, in, in correspondence with Wallace during the 32 campaign, really kind of lays out the idea that there's going to have to be a, max, a mass exodus of progressives from the Republican Party into the Democratic Party in the hope of transforming it. And, I, and you know, they're ultimately quite successful in turning the Democratic Party definitively into a pro-labor party, into a party that's in favor of consumer rights. And in the case particularly of Ickes, who had been in the NAACP, ultimately a, uh, a party that's interested in the civil rights of African American. Um, so that's one of the major strains in the New Deal is the fulfillment of a lot of pro- progressive Republican ambitions that had been you know, only partially fulfilled under Theodore Roosevelt and then had been pretty well ignored by Republicans after the Mm-hmm. So that's part of it. Part of it is uh, the Bryanite, William Jennings Bryan, that is strain of the party going all the way back to the 1890s, where there is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, tremendous mm-hmm. section of the Democratic Party, which constitutes poor or not very well off farmers who are chronically, therefore, debtors and who are very interested in cheap money and in federal support for farming more broadly, you know, that has tremendous fulfillment in the New Deal. And then there's a lot of stuff that's mm-hmm. borrowed from watching early welfare states in Europe in terms of social insurance policies. Perkins is very important here in helping to implement uh, unemployment insurance, old age insurance. They talk about health insurance, ultimately reject that idea. Um, but to, to bring in uh, a lot of what gets a disability insurance and so forth uh, gets brought in under the New Deal, also from kind of examining what other nations are doing and taking that lesson. A lot of it comes from Roosevelt's term. Uh, he's elected a sitting governor of New York. And, you know, the successes that he has had in terms of fighting the Depression at the level of New York State which involve a lot of work relief and public works, which, of course, become the central feature of the New Deal in terms of recovery. You know, the New Deal is this massive investment uh, in America, mm-hmm. what we now rather colorlessly call infrastructure, but what uh, during the 1930s was generally referred to as public works. And so many of these are quite spectacular. You know, you think about you know, the major uh, dam systems of the Tennessee Valley Authority or the Western Dams at the Shasta Dam or the Hoover Dam or the big bridges, the Triborough Bridge and the Br- Bay Bridge and uh, you know, the airports like LaGuardia and all of these things get put in. But there's also the much uh, more humdrum infrastructure, you know, the vast the vaster part of Works Progress Administration spending and the vaster number of people employed on that program are in the business of building and widening roads, which becomes a, you know, a tremendous basis for the post-war boom is this new network of good roads in the United States. So mm-hmm. it's, there's that sort of that transformation of the country by means of public works is, is rooted in the experience of combating the depression before the war. Some of those ideas are imported from uh, the economist John Maynard Keynes, who of course is uh, mm-hmm. a major influence uh, and more so as time goes on on the New Deal. There are also ideas that come from the uh, progressive Republican era of conservation and of thinking holistically in terms of how 
built world acts in concert with the natural world. And so when they go at things like the Tennessee Valley Authority, they think not only about the dams and the farming and the fertilizer and the electricity and the flood control and the river navigability, but also about the erosion and the trees and the fish and the waterfowl. And so they, you know, they don't get everything. They're often really quite terrible consequences of some of these major Mm -hmm. and rapidly conceived and execute ideas, but they try to think in these kind of what we would now call ecological terms. So uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the short answer to which that was a very uh, a ver short version of that answer is uh, there are a lot of things that go into the museum and an awful lot of things that come out of it. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I hadn't even thought about the roads, but I, I, I'm at Indiana University Bloomington. I, go to, I work at the Kinsey Institute and every day I walk down the road and there is a on the sidewalk there there's a this this road was widened due to the public work project but you can you can still see them kind of everywhere um, you can walk around you know where i live in davis california there are sidewalks downtown that have stamps saying wpa 1938 a sidewalk will last pretty mm -hmm. much forever unless a tree root gets it right and so yeah a lot of the built environment that we still have particularly the public parts of it are products of the 1930s. Now we should say to yourselves, you know, is all of it still in quite as good shape as those sidewalks? Uh, you know, perhaps not. Look at look where the airport. Mm. But that's that's another yeah. story. I, I was going to. Uh, you mentioned him, but I was going to draw it out a little bit um, about Keynes. Um, what, how, he seems to take on such a, a massive role in American economic history now, but especially a big role um, in Roosevelt. Himself. Right. Well. As you as you might know, I, I wrote a book about the relationship between Roosevelt's politics and Keynes' ideas, um, which I think is is worth spending some time on. You know, there there are both these kinds of outsized figures, one in, in intellectual history and one in political history, and they have more in common than you might think, but uh, you know, also still perhaps not that much. I mean, but Roosevelt was Roosevelt was more of an ideas <laughs> man than he usually gets credit for, and Keynes was more of a politician. You know, Keynes is vitally important to British uh, political and economic history for at several important phases. You know, he was at the Versailles Conference. Uh, to bring an end to the First World War, and he famously quit the conference because he was not being listened to when he was saying there need to be structures in place for the reconstruction of Europe after the war and for giving you know a boost to these new nations. You know, there's a dozen new nations or whatever created out of uh, the Versailles Treaty. They have no credit, right? They have no financial history Keynes is making the case. And Wilson particularly is um, really quite uninterested in any form of economic policy. And so the, the treaty ends up having yeah. nothing like, you know, what would become very important aspects of the post-World War II settlement, largely because Keynes, you know, is still around in 1944 and is still influential or is influential <laughs> again in being the architect of that sentiment. So that arc of his career about what do you do to prevent a major war is a very important part of that interwar story. The other thing that's very important about him, of course, is his prescriptions for monetary and fiscal policy in the case of an economic crisis. And basically his argument in both cases is go big, you know, print as much money as you possibly can, mm -hmm. stay away from all kinds of arguments like you need to adhere to hard money or a gold standard. And then the other hand, uh, you know, spend money that you don't have, again, on public works so that uh, you can put lots of people to work and provide what we now understand to be an economic stimulus. And yeah, Keynes looms very large. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say, again, in macroeconomic thinking, you know, he was out of style, uh, owing to the rise of more conservative movements politically and intellectually beginning in the 1970s and extending through the period of Thatcher and Reagan. Uh, he came back in with a vengeance after, after 2007, 2008, and everyone suddenly discovered, good golly, yeah. uh, some of those Keynesian ideas might be, might be good. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, Roosevelt, from the time Hitler comes in, which is just before Roosevelt's inaugurated, really thinks of the New Deal as mm -hmm. a measure to prevent the rise of fascism. He's actively worried 
that the United States will have a fascist movement. You know, he mentions this during the 32 campaign. He's really much more worried about it with Hitler's accession to power because he thinks that, you know, Hitler being in power is going to strengthen Mussolini being in power. It's going to strengthen the forces of rightward movements, you know, throughout the world, including within the United States. It turns out he's not wrong about that. You know, the... Um, mm pretty much the week after Hitler comes to power, you know, one of his aides, Rudolf Hess, uh, you know, gives the go ahead to establish a Nazi movement in the United States. And, you know, there's a, there's yeah. a, there's a really very good reason to be worried about the possibility of the rise of a fascist or Nazi movement within the United States, pretty much from 1933 onwards. So Roosevelt's view is greater prosperity more widespread prosperity, or if you like, economic democracy, is the essential basis for the survival of political democracy. And the New Deal proceeds with that overriding idea, you know, for everything, that all of the things that it provides mm -hmm. to people in the United States are by way of showing them that their democracy works for them and that they shouldn't abandon it, you know, for some other form of government. So I think, I think you have to have that idea in the back of your head whenever you're thinking about what the New Deal does for the idea of America and for the idea of public resources in America, that it's all with that idea of, you know, yeah. hoping that democracy can survive when it's really legitimately under threat. You know, I mentioned before that one of the weaknesses of the Democratic Party is that it's beholden to its white supremacist Southern wing. This becomes one of the defining features of the New Deal, that Roosevelt needs to depend on Southern votes in Congress to get through uh, New Deal measures. And so in many cases, they're very limited in their aid to Black Americans, or they're actually actively hostile to Black Americans, you know, especially things like I mentioned yeah. already, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which operates pretty much exclusively in the Jim Crow South, takes cognizance of that. It's run by white Southern Democrats for white Southern Democrats, does not really benefit Black Southerners and is in many cases actively hostile to them. On the other hand, in other parts of the country, you know, where you have the Works Progress Administration, it does hire Black workers. And so the New Deal does benefit Black workers. So while Roosevelt gets a large and notable number of black votes in 1932. You know, he gets a majority of black votes in 1936, even though he's still got a party that's got a considerable and powerful uh, white supremacist wing, which makes it increasingly difficult for him to operate around those kinds of issues. He tries to ditch a lot of segregationists in 1938. He's unsuccessful. In 1939, he establishes a civil rights enforcement unit in the Department of Justice. Ultimately, that becomes the Civil Rights Division under Eisenhower. They begin bringing voting rights cases almost immediately. You know, the Democratic Party, very slowly, but over many years, becomes friendlier to the idea of black civil rights. And that really begins under Roosevelt and is properly understood to be part of it. He's doing it in response to black voters shifting to the Democratic Party. We have to continue to have these votes, mm -hmm. and it would be attractive to win these votes. That means you don't have to depend as much on white Southerners. So, you know, black voters join the Democratic Party and make it respond to them, I think is the right way of thinking about it. And that's, uh, that's an mm -hmm. important event of the 1930s and into the 1940s. But it's... Um, well, it's important because it happens alongside the New Deal in many ways failing black voters. You know, I mean, like I said, many of its uh, many of its projects are segregated or worse. Many of its projects perpetuate segregation or even further it, you know, especially in the form of public housing and other kinds of housing policies. And so, as I say, the Democratic Party continues to have this split character uh, into the 1930s and 40s. But the balance is however slowly shifting. Uh, you know, with the, the New Deal, as I say, continues to try to spread economic prosperity and push it downward. There's a very vitally important pro-labor legislation in the form of the Wagner Act in 1935. Um, in addition to all these public works programs, it leads to a surge in unionization. And again, so you have the Democratic Party sort of responding to workers flocking to it, and they're in turn helping to empower that sector.
So there's a, there's a kind of pattern there of where people move to the party and the party kind of then moves to those factions of the electorate. I think I kind of want to return to that question, um, kind of kind of lead us in the sort of general direction of what do you think can be learned from that? Um, that's something we've returned back to. Is like we we look back to the Great Depression, and be like, oh well, we don't want the Great Recession to turn into the Second Great Depression. But in a sense, we're also um, I think maybe you're suggesting we can learn something from the voters. I think that's that right. Well. I mean, I think if you wanted me to say, you know, what lesson did we learn and what lesson should we have learned, I guess. Um, you know, in 2008 mm. and nine, when uh, Barack Obama was first running for and then won the presidency and then and became president, it was a period when a lot of people were saying, well, we have learned from the 1930s what to do and what not to do in the Great Depression. And one of the things we've learned to do is, is those kinds of Keynesian lessons that I described already. You know, you need to have lots cheaper money and you need to have really strong backup for the banks and you need to have massive fiscal stimulus. So you got all those things, you know, even from Republicans like Ben Bernanke, you know, you got very activist government, you got very cheap money or as, as cheap as they could possibly make it. Right. And then, of course, in 2009, you did get a, spent, a stimulus bill, although even at the time, people said this is not going to be big enough to achieve the results. I, th I think that if I wanted to sum up what the lessons that they did learn from the Great Depression New Deal were, they were technical lessons. Like, this is how you meet this crisis. You pull this lever, you push this button. I would say that the lesson that they didn't learn is mm -hmm. the one I've been trying to uh, emphasize in our discussion here is this larger lesson of ensuring that the run of American voters felt invested in their government and feel that the government really belongs to them. Mm. There's very little of that in 2008 and nine. You know, in the 1930s, those WPA plaques and signs are ubiquitous. There are millions of Americans who are employed by the WPA. In every county of the country, there's a WPA project, you know. For as much money was spent by the uh, Obama era stimulus in 2009, you know, it wasn't as widespread. It wasn't as hyped. There wasn't that investment in the symbolic democratic with a small d value of these projects. And so I think that message of uh, widespread ownership in what we together were doing was not carried over from the mm. New Deal to the modern era. And I, and I think that was one of the reasons that people felt kind of let down by the Obama, the sort of technocratic response yeah. of the Obama era. You know, there wasn't this kind of massive small D democratic involvement or investment. So that's, that's kind of how I'd answer that question. Yeah. And I think, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, this, a couple of the speechwriters for Obama, obviously Pod Save America, but they they did say one of their biggest regrets and one of the things they needed, wish they had done better, um, is hyping it more and is to bring up that and to invest and kind of push that more. So it's kind of like a why why too bad we didn't learn this lesson. Yeah, you know, I mean I don't know enough about the insides yeah. of the Obama administration, particular on the political side. I'm not sure that that book has actually been written yet. I, I did contribute an essay to a collection that Julian Zelizer put together called The Presidency of Barack Obama, and, and mine was on the, the economic policy, as you might, might expect. But um, I think that ju judging from the other contributions, we still lack a lot of the significant uh, archival information, and maybe we always will. But there does seem to have been this weird kind of contempt for the New Deal and for liberal Democrats more generally at the top of the Obama administration. And I'd like somebody to kind of tease that out, but I don't, I don't know if we'll ever, we'll ever get that kind of inside story. So I guess kind of um, to bring us towards, uh, I guess, a final conclusion, um, you, you've kind of given, I think, probably one of the most comprehensive histories of this, just how the New Deal kind of got rolling and started. But, um, and you and we talked a little bit about how, um, what we could have learned from it, but what do you think is important to remember um, from both, maybe both um, the New Deal and maybe economic history in general? I think, again, the thing to remember about the New Deal is the vital importance of giving 
for lack of a better phrase, ordinary Americans a sense that they are intimately involved in what their government is doing, that they are not helpless at the mercy of these massive institutions and forces, but that these massive institutions does actually belong to and are responsive to us. You know, that's that's the essence of what really made the mm -hmm. New Deal successful. So that even when, you know, in 1937, there was another economic downturn after, you know, four or five years of very high speed economic growth, suddenly there was a stumble, there was a downturn, you know, Roosevelt didn't lose a lot of political ground in that people still stuck with him. People still reelected him to be the leader of the United States going into what they knew would be a massive European war. You know, that he had earned a tremendous amount of faith and a tremendous amount of sort of, again, small d democratic credibility. I think that's the big lesson that we need to learn, that it shouldn't be experts sitting in a room somewhere writing up sums and, and, and as I say, fiddling with the arcane controls of the massive machine that is our economy. It should be a mobilization of all of us for dealing with the big crisis. And if you want to carry forward into mm -hmm. the near future, you know, there, just in the past few weeks, this slogan, you know, the Green New Deal, has gone from being the project of the extreme left of the Democratic Party and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to being endorsed by, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris. And it's now become something that pretty much any serious contender for the Democratic nomination needs to say that they're in favor of. Whether that will last into 2020, I don't know. But just at the moment, that's happened. And that's quite interesting because I think it is symbolic of this idea that we need a large and actually democratic effort to combat the crises of our own time. I agree. I don't think I could uh, more enthusiastically agree. I don't. I, I hope you're not thinking about running for president. I, I am not. I am <laughs> totally uninterested in that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the country's lost. I just wanna. I just wanna say thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate that. It's very kind of you. And uh, I, I, I'm really grateful that you have given the time. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.